everyone. Good afternoon. We're here interviewing Mr. Sid Gantman. It is Thursday, March 26, 1998, and the interview is being done at the Morse Institute Library. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sid, um, why don't you give us your full name, your age if you don't mind, your current address, I know your wife is still living, your wife's name, and some background on your children and your family. Sure. My name is Sid Gantman. I'm 78 years old. I have two sons, Mark and Rick Gantman, who attended public schools here uh, up through the uh, middle school. In Natick. In Natick. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife Gladys and I resided in Natick. And do you have grandchildren? Yes, we have two. They live with Mark and his wife Roberta in Saginaw, Michigan. Do you see them often? No, not as often as I'd like to. I'd even babysit <laughs> if they were closer. But uh, uh, they get on the telephone and we have quite a conversation. Wonderful. I do send them uh, cards every other week, one to each. Uh, the younger one is interested in dinosaurs. He's six and uh, he has a collection of dinosaur postcards you wouldn't believe. The older one, she is nine, a beautiful redhead, a uh, beautiful redhead, and uh, she loves to write. Wonderful. She's won some awards, and uh, she now be, uh, is responding to my cards. Wonderful. Now, you were not raised in Natick. No. Uh, I was born in Russia. When and did you move to the United States? Well, uh, it's a long story. Uh, my parents and I were headed for Palestine out of uh, uh, Warsaw, Poland, when the British came up with a white paper prohibiting families with children from immigrating to Palestine. What year was this? What was that? What year? That was about 1920 or 21, I'm not sure. And uh, the ship, this was while the ship was on the high seas with a boatload of immigrants uh, slated. They were Zionists slated to go to Palestine. The ship pulled into Portugal to see where, to find out where they could go with these people. And it was finally decided that they would go to Argentina. And that's where my younger brother was born. Mm -hmm. My father, however, had four sisters living in the Boston area, and uh, they worked very hard to get their one and only brother, the youngest in the family, to come up to the U.S., and that's where my sister was born. So each sibling was born on a different continent. So how old were you when you left Russia? Uh, not quite one. And how old were you when you came to the United States? Uh, about five. And you grew up in? I grew up uh, primarily in Roxbury, Dorchester area. And you mentioned to me before we started taping that your dad owned a deli? Yes. Uh, he owned two delis. Uh, 
one on Morton Street. And, uh, and then after he sold that, he bought one in Roxbury on Humboldt Avenue. And it was a reasonably good living for him and the family. But it did involve a considerable amount of time. If we were paid uh, 10 cents an hour for the hours put in, <laughs> we might have done better. But it was a good life, and uh, my father uh, truly enjoyed meeting with and dealing with people. That must be where you get that type of character too, correct? Well, uh, my mother wasn't a shrinking violet, that's for sure. Uh, when did you enter the military, and at I, what age? I entered at about, I say, 21 years of age. At that time, we were living in uh, Roxbury, and there was a, I was a senior at Northeastern University School of Engineering. And it does seem odd that I was inducted as a senior in engineering, knowing that uh, uh, engineers were very much in demand, in the service and out of service. But it so happened that my younger brother, Moulton, was attending Louisiana State University. And uh, he joined a Marine contingent at the university. And then uh, three or four months after that, he received a notice from the draft board to report for induction. He wrote a letter back informing him that he was a member of the Marines. Uh, they are keeping him at school for the time being. But it seems that the draft board did not accept that. They wrote a letter uh, to the family stating that uh, uh, he had to report for induction. Otherwise, criminal action would be taken. So. I went to the Marine barracks uh, at the Boston Naval Shipyard, and I spoke to the commandant there, a Lieutenant Colonel Krulwich. And I told the colonel that uh, the man wouldn't leave the family alone. That's the chairman of the induction board. So he called the chairman of the board, who was a judge in the judicial system of Boston. And he told him in no uncertain words and terms that my brother, Milton, was in fact a Marine, and keep your hands off. I received my induction notice two weeks later. I. Uh, I didn't fight it, and uh, I was inducted uh, at uh, Fort Devens. This was into the Army? I uh, entered the Army, and I was assigned to the 150th Combat Engineer Battalion. Just being formed at Fort Devens, and uh, there we stayed for basic training. I, however, had no basic training. Because of my engineering background, they put me on a drafting board at headquarters, and uh, using uh, guidance from the so-called field manuals, I designed various military structures uh, to be constructed at Fort Devens, including a 30 caliber machine gun range and other items, including an ammunition uh, storage facility. 
no basic training. One day, bringing the plans up to headquarters at Fort Devens, I noticed there was a sign uh, stating that all applicants for aviation cadets please report to building such and such, which I did because I was very much interested in aeronautical engineering. I took the exam and lo and behold, the headquarters up at the 150th Engineer Battalion was very much upset when orders came through transferring me from, the, from their organization to the U.S. Army Air Force, uh, Air Corps, excuse me. There, everything took a turn. What time span are we talking here? You left, you left um, uh, university uh, at 21. Was this six months later? Uh, no, it was about four months. Four months, okay. Four months later, mm -hmm. without any basic training. Mm -hmm. uh, so was, you were transferred, you mentioned, to the U.S. Army Air Corps. Right. Then were you, you transferred out of Fort Devens? Uh, it was, I was shipped out of Fort Devens, and I wound up at Susquehanna University. And where is that? That's in Pennsylvania, outside of Sellens Grove. And that uh, was identified as an, uh, for aviation students. However, with my educational background, I did more tutoring than uh, learning. And uh, I tutored primarily in physics and spherical trigonometry. After completing my three months at the school, I was shipped to Nashville, Tennessee, uh, where the classification center for the Air Corps was established. When you were shipped to Nashville, were you sent as an individual or as part of a unit? Uh, uh, not a unit, but as a group of soldiers unassigned. There I took the, again, exams for the classification, and uh, I qualified nine as a bombardier, nine as a navigator, and nine as a pilot. And this is nine out of ten? Out of ten. And uh, uh, I was only interested in flying. So that was my selection and that was my undoing. <laughs> Eventually, uh, in working my way through the uh, Air Corps uh, stations, I wound up at Columbus Army Airfield, and I think that was in Mississippi. And there I was in a pilot pool for about four or five weeks. What was your rank at this time? At that time, just an aviation cadet. Mm -hmm. And uh, It, it so happened that uh, the Army decided, in their wisdom, we had too many pilots. And they took a whole batch of us and shipped us to the infantry. I was glad to get moving. It was enough. I wound up with 103rd Infantry Division at Camp, Camp Housie in Texas. And again, was this as a group or a uh, unit yet? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. 
the 103rd Infantry Division was a unit. We went in to uh, bring it up to strength. And after about four or five weeks, we were alerted for overseas and we were o uh, on our way. How did, how did you notify your family that you would be going overseas? Well, I, I wrote to my parents at least three times a week. I tried to drop them a line every day, especially since the mail didn't cost anything and envelopes and paper were available. And uh, I could always, uh, most of the time, I did find that there was time available. When you were notified about going overseas, did your orders say... Oh, I didn't notify him. I couldn't notify him until I got overseas. Okay. And when, when you were notified, did they tell you, did the Army tell you where you would be going? No. No. I, uh, uh, my folks knew. I told them that when we go overseas, you're not going to hear from me for at least two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. So you went on oh, a uh, ship? We, we went, a, uh, I don't know what the name of the ship was, but I remember being put down an e-hold that was just over the keel of the ship. And being the smallest guy in my squad, I was given the top bunk underneath a cold water condensing pipe. And uh, the moisture would collect on the pipe and drip on me from the bell, the bell of the pipe. It was horrible. But uh, somehow or other, I got by. When you were with this group, being shipped overseas. Did what, you What was that? When you were with your unit being yeah. shipped overseas. Yeah. Did you establish close friendships with the group? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. We knew that uh, each relied with their life on the other. And uh, it was a sense of community that I have never forgotten. Do you still maintain contact with any of them? Well, there are I only maintained contact with about 12, those that I was immediately involved with. And of the 12, there are only two that I know that are left alive. And they have stopped writing, so I don't know. So when you were shipped overseas, where did you, where, where did you land when you ended All right, up? We, uh, landed in Marseille. Marseille had been taken over uh, two or three weeks earlier by the invasion of southern France. Uh, and uh, from there we get out and uh, I think we get on, uh, we were camped at a station just outside of uh, Marseille uh, for equipment checks, make sure that everything that we had was uh, as it should be in good operating condition and so forth. Then we got on, after about three or four days of this checking, we went north uh, on uh, trucks and uh, not long after, we get out of the trucks and uh, we were assembled in an area behind the Seventh Army where again, we were checked out and then available for combat. So how soon after you landed and then you went north, were you involved in combat? Uh, I, I should say probably no more than a week. 
What were, do you remember your feelings then? You were only a 21-year-old. Oh, well, I, I remember being hungry. I thought I would beat the chow on the ship by buying a bunch of these, a box of peanut butter, uh, I forget what they call them. They are, they're very well known around here. And I got sick on peanut butter. It began to <laughs> choke me. So I gave the rest of them away. But the food wasn't bad, wasn't bad. I, I guess I, uh, we might call them sea rations. And uh, then we began to work as a unit. And we stayed together as a unit. Were you afraid? Yes. Can you not touch this? Move your hand. Thank you. Um, yes, I was. Uh, I wasn't happy, but uh, we were a unit, and uh, we depended on each other. Did you all openly talk about your fears to uh, each other? No, no, but we knew. You knew. We knew. Who were some of your closest friends during that time? And well, you said you did maintain contact. You said only 12. I think that's exceptional. Well, um, what, uh, what happened to some of them? Well, there were two or three that were killed. Mm. There was Seymour Hang and I. We set up as buddies. And uh, uh, we stuck together. Uh, there was one time we were in our foxholes and it seems that uh, our battalion captured a distillery. And uh, it was a good one because they had nothing but cognac. Our colonel did not object to us filling up our uh, canteens with a cognac. So when we were put out an outpost, uh, that's the station between our own troops and the German troops, uh, we got into our foxhole and uh, they told us that no one dared come close to us because we were arguing about uh, our cribbage score and loud as can be and people were just, even the sergeant of the guard did not come up to check us out. They said we were vociferous. <laughs> and uh, that was one of the times, uh, even though the uh, mud and the water in the bottom of the foxhole was an irritant, that cribbage game was most important. We used candle at night to play, and all they could hear is Seymour and myself addressing each other in not too endearing terms. But uh, that's one thing that we both uh, uh, remember and laugh over. Now, at that time, you were in Europe. You were only 21. Mm. You did not go through what was considered a basic training. Were you in any way prepared for facing the, not only the enemy, but facing members of your unit dying in front of you? Well, I was physically in reasonably good shape. Uh, you've got to realize the training is repetition and repetition. I've been through it not as many times as the Army uh, would like to have their uh, soldiers go through, but uh, I'm a quick study. And uh, uh, I didn't feel uh, uh, lost at all. I, when I fired my weapon, for uh, record, believe it or not, I fired a uh, 
a perfect score at 500 yards. The rifle used at that time was the Enfield. It's an old British weapon, and I had a sore shoulder when I got through, but uh, my eyesight was good, and I was relatively uh, uh, well trained in marksmanship. During your time over there, what season was it when you arrived in France? Uh, I should say it was, oh, about the end of October. The end of October. Uh, I believe that was in 43. I'm not sure. Was it 43 or 44? How, I think it was 44, I'm sorry. How did you hear about the war in other areas? What, how did, For what? instance, you were in France. Mm. Did you hear from your commanding officers about how, what was happening elsewhere during the war? Well, you know, it's... Uh, the Army was pretty good that way because they briefed us with respect to the progress in other areas, uh, in the South Pacific, uh, uh, mostly. They did not give us any, insofar as I can remember, inputs on the way the European theater was going. However, the Stars and Stripes did give us more than enough information especially with the comic strip of Willie and Joe. That was the one thing we fought over. Was that a satirical comic strip? What was that? Was it a satirical comic strip? Uh, it was true to life. Uh, unshaven, dirty, and beautiful words of wisdom. While in that area, did you have communications with some of the townspeople? Uh, if we did, it was only momentarily. We were going through a town, oh, I don't know, uh, in Alsace, when this elderly, emaciated person came up to me. I don't know why he picked me, but he had a yellow star of David on his breast pocket. And he said to me, Bittishin, ich bin ein Yehudi. Kann Sie mir helfen? In other words, uh, please, sir, I am Jewish. Can you help me? At that time, did you understand German? Yes. Were you fluent yes. in other languages? Uh, I was fairly fluent. I had three years of it at my high school. Did you speak French also? Uh, in petit peu. Other languages? Uh, not really. Not really. So when he said this to you, what, were you stunned? Yes. Why did he pick me? Out of all the others, he had bypassed others. And uh, I said, uh, yes, what do you need? He said, I need clothing. So I said, here, take this house, take what you need, and get out. I was out of my depth, I admit it, but how can you say no? Uh, that's it. And you have no idea what happened to him? No, no. How long were you over in Europe? Oh, about two years. And you were a single young man at that time. Right. What was it like coming back? And were you, at what point did you come back? Well, I received a field commission Uh, and from there, 
I was assigned to the 41st Engineer General Service Regiment, Company D. And where was that? Uh, uh, I was shipped back to Marseille, France. They were black troops, good soldiers. Did you have any contact with them? Were not, they a not up to that time, not up to that time. However, one of my proudest accomplishments There was a very bright youngster, and when he signed his name with an X, I forced him to go to school, forced him. And the most war rewarding experience that I had in years was when he sent me a letter, Dear Lieutenant Gimmett, but it was close enough so that the letter didn't get to me, and I want to thank you, he said, and it was wonderful. I did some good. Very rewarding. When you, became, when you got your commission, did you then become a lieutenant at that time? Yeah. And so you were in Marseille, and then did you come back to stateside? Uh, let me see. No, because the, uh, the unit, after the war was over, was shipped into uh, Germany. And Company D was put up in Gerolshofen, Germany. And where is that? <laughs> I'm sorry you asked. <laughs> I can't tell you truly. Well, we will have maps so we okay. can point out where that is. Do you know how to spell that? Uh, G E R. Phonetically, E L Z H O F E N. And we were put up in a an aluminum plant that manufactured aluminum. And. Uh, Was the plant in working order at that time? No, no. It's just that the company, we, there were plenty, it was plenty of room, and the officers' quarters, uh, however, we were not in the plant. They were across the street in the administrative uh, headquarters. So you were behind enemy lines, yes? Yeah. And you were in combat at that time? What? No, no, the war was over when, oh, uh, when we moved into Gerald's mm -hmm. In moving there, what was your duty? Uh, as a platoon leader. Were you involved in um, helping any of the prisoners of war or any of the... No, I wasn't, but back uh, my infantry division was involved in uh, the capture of and the freeing of uh, uh, victims of the Holocaust uh, at Landsberg, L-A-N-D-S-B-U-R-G. Did you come into contact with any of those victims? No, because I was already wounded and I was in a hospital back in... Oh, well, back up now. How did that occur? You said you were wounded. Oh, uh, an explosion, and I hurt. That was it. Mm -hmm. Shell. And you were hospitalized? Yeah, for about oh, 10 to 12 weeks. Where were you hospitalized? Again, I can't get away from Marseille. <laughs> so this, you went to Germany after you were wounded? Uh, yes. Okay. After I, when I was released from the hospital, I went to uh, I caught up with my unit, but peace was already uh, uh, in order. And I caught up with my unit in uh, uh, Austria. And then from Austria went into Germany? Uh, no, I had to go through Germany to get to Austria. I see, I see. 
when you became a a lieutenant and received your commission mm. and you were at that point in time as you mentioned earlier brought back to Marseille were you then with an entirely new unit and had to befriend new what was that again? were you with a new unit and yes. had to befriend a whole new group of yeah yeah comrades I, so to speak uh, at that time I'm sorry to say that they had white officers only except for the chaplain who was black and at that time I thought it was a terrible mistake but it has since been rectified uh, we had the same problems with those guys as we did with the white troops they there were those that ducked, there were those that did their job, and uh, there were those that, I'll do it if you can catch me. So, it was a real experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything else. Thinking back, what were some of your most memorable experiences, whether they be sad or humorous or just unforgettable? I think as an aviation student, because I had so much time in my hand, I got into all sorts of troubles. And I had to walk my tours 50 minutes out of every hour for each demerit. And it so happened there were two or three others that were in the same boat as I. And uh, I. I, I, I find that uh, I, I lose track. Well, anyway, after three weeks and one month of walking tours on weekends and an hour every day, uh, the company, uh, the, uh, the school commander, the commandant called us in. He said, you three men have been doing your uh, tours very well and I will give you this weekend off it so happened it was three days before payday and I was the only one that had any money I think I had six or seven dollars and the rest of the guys were broke so we decided we'll go down to the American Legion in the town of Sunbury in Pennsylvania and there I went and I took my first dime and put it in the slot machine hit the jackpot $11 <laughs> I took two more dimes and put it in the second machine and at the second one I hit the jackpot another $11 all right that's $22 so we decided we'll have lunch Meanwhile, I can't remember his name. There's this chap, he lived up in Lynn. And the other uh, uh, member of our trio was a mule skinner, believe it or not, Emenecker from uh, oh, the Ozarks. Well, we sat down to lunch. Meanwhile, this chap from uh, Lynn invited three girls to sit down with us for lunch. He did it on his own. So, after lunch, I and Emmenecker excused ourselves. We went into the men's room and we jumped out the window. And we left uh, this chap from Lynn with a bill and the three girls and he didn't have the money. <laughs> and when he realized what happened, he did the same thing we did. He left the girls. I don't know if that's good, but we, we laugh about it now. <laughs> and uh, Emmenecker and I, we went into Philadelphia, and there we went to the USO. They had a wonderful USO, a tremendous show. 
And when we finally get back to quarters, Monday about 5 o'clock, there was this chap from Lynn asleep in my bunk waiting for me. So I went down to his bunk and I went to sleep there. He was bull. <laughs> he was <laughs> mad. But uh, we laugh about it now. Yes. That is where no one really got hurt. I pity those poor girls. But uh, it's one of those things. They're probably still talking about it. Too, yeah. Right? <laughs> Once you were, well, the war was declared over and you came back stateside. Uh huh. Where did you well, arrive? Well, I came back and. Uh, I think I spent about a week or two in a uh, hospital here in Framingham. What was that? Uh, the uh, can't remember the name. It was a military hospital, mm -hmm. and uh, and then I was separated from the service. At what rank? Uh, as the lieutenant. Mm -hmm. What was next? What did you do then? Went back to school. Went back to school, to Northeastern? Huh? Back North, to Northeastern. Northeastern. To finish your degree? Ha yeah. And, and then what? And at this point, I'm assuming you're about 23, 24 years about old? About then. Still single? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got involved with a construction game. And uh, enjoyed it, but that wasn't a way to make a living and raise a family. Now, you were finishing school. You were working construction. Mm. Were you planning a marriage then? Had you met no, your wife no, yet? No, no, no. It's just that uh, I, uh, my parents were elderly, mm -hmm. and uh, and I. Uh, I know they needed my support, uh, not that it was much, uh, only moral support, uh, be around. My uh, brother went uh, back to school and uh, my sister now, was in school. Now we didn't mention on tape about your sister, but tell us about her. You had mentioned to me her being a nursing oh, cadet. Yeah. Sure. Explain she, uh, a little on that. She was a nursing cadet. And uh, just to round out the military experience, and my mother was a, uh, a very avid blood donor. She used to go down to the Red Cross uh, uh, donor station in Dudley Street in Roxbury uh, to give her blood every two months. Now, your sister being a nursing cadet, did that take her out of the United States? No. Mm -hmm. No. She finally wound up getting her master's at Boston University in nursing. What was it, you mentioned giving your family moral support, especially your elderly parents. What, it, what was it like for you returning and having to pick up where you left off, having just been in a war and been wounded? It, well. It was difficult because I had to go back and take a refresher year at Northeastern, at Northeastern, mm -hmm. and then continue on from there. Was it an adjustment period for you? What was that? An adjustment period for you? Yes, there was. There was. Was there depression? Huh? Were you depressed at all? Well, not really, but. Uh, I I, uh, I wasn't sure, truly. I was glad to be alive and, uh, and glad to be able to do things for myself. At that time, did you have organizations with other veterans that you could maybe no. discuss your war efforts? No, no, I did not get involved with veteran activities until, oh wait, yes, yes I was. I was involved with the Jewish war veterans. 
and it was through them that I met this former Boston Red Sox player by the name of Cy Rosenthal. He was a paraplegic. Uh, he lost the use of his uh, legs. He also lost his only child, a son who was a Marine, on the invasion of, I think it was, I don't know if it was Christmas Island or Christmas Day, uh, when he lost his son. And uh, Cy was in the Coast Guard, and they were uh, uh, in the English Channel uh, clearing mines when a uh, mine exploded and uh, he lost the use of his two legs. And uh, with the help of a, ch of a chap by the name of Levine, we used to call him Chief, who was a uh, uh, funeral director. We were able to set up a, uh, a day at Fenway Park for uh, Cy and uh, went out and we raised over $10,000 to build him a an accessible home. And this was in the late 40s? That was in the, no, mid 40s. Mid 40s. Yeah. That's amazing. Amazing story. Well, uh, it, you had to do something. So you feel this was your way of coping with what you had been involved uh, with? I was, I was so far ahead and above that, uh, I was lucky. Looking back now, how important do you feel your service in the military was? And, and, and how? I think that every, every able-bodied person, not only men, but women too, should serve their country. One way or another, if it's the Peace Corps, or even community activities, or in a service. What did you think back then, and what do you think now regarding your war efforts in World War II, and the, the war effort itself in World War II? Well, the world certainly is a better place for what the Western allies accomplished. One of the questions that a number of our veterans have wanted to be asked, and so I'm asking this of you too, is about your feelings about the, the political differences of opinion and the public opinion of the veterans from your generation, World War II, from the Korean War and the Vietnam War. I feel very strongly that our country did not, did not back the Vietnam veterans when they were on duty as much as they should. I believe that politically we were wrong. To have gone over? Well, whichever, whatever the story was, I'm not saying that we were wrong for going there, but we were wrong for not pursuing the matter to the full hilt. We asked these men to go out there and give of their life, and we weren't completely 100% behind them. Getting back to your family life, um, at what point in time did you meet Gladys? Oh, that was, I went into a uh, automobile sales room, 
to buy a Studebaker. And she was a bookkeeper there, and I married her. And you married her. How soon after you met her did you marry her? Oh, I don't know. Uh, three, four months, oh. five months. You knew this was the one. How many years later? You're married now. How many years? Oh, let's see, 48. 48 years. And at what point in time did you uh, move to Natick? See, I, I was stationed at uh, Raytheon Company for the U.S. Army Missile Command. Uh, at, at the Raytheon Andover plant. I tried to buy a home there in Andover, but the costs were exorbitant. I finally wound up in Natick. I liked what I saw, and here I am. Admittedly, 30 miles each way, but it was well worth it. Now you had mentioned to me that you stayed in the military and in reserve, reserve capacity. capacity. And for how many years? About 34. And can you tell the audience what your rank is currently? Lieutenant Colonel. Finishing up this conversation, which we have certainly enjoyed, is there one thought or memory that you would like to share with your family or with the community or with the many future generations who will be watching this tape at some point in time? Well, again, uh, it has made me very much aware of our community and uh, I, I feel that I have responded. I've given the equivalent of 85 gallons of blood. Uh, I, while living here in Natick, I've raised well over 2,000 uh, conifers, uh, trees, and I've given to my neighbors, uh, the Boy Scouts when they wanted to raise money, a friend of mine was uh, a headmaster at a school out on uh, Thompson Island. I gave him 200 trees to plant on the island. I don't know how well they took, but the school has since been dissolved. Uh, and uh, cystic fibrosis. Uh, at the age of 78, I'm still climbing to prudential for cystic fibrosis. So you've been involved in that, your community. The community is all important. Giving back to the community, too. Mr. Gantman, thank you so much. We have very much enjoyed this. Thank you.